Oh, we just may go with one camera. Okay, that is not a problem. All right. So um, Debbie, could you introduce yourself and tell us what you'll be working on today? Yes, you can hear me. So Absolutely. I, am, um, I am working on a four shaft loom. I'm actually making fingertip towels. Since um, COVID started, it's kind of funny. I put paper towels in my bathroom if we have anyone in the house in case they don't want to use my own towel. So now I'm kind of making a little set of towels that my guests will use and I can just keep washing and reusing. Wonderful, I love it. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off video and I'm gonna turn off my audio. I will okay. only pop in if there's a question. So go ahead and uh, start weaving. Show us what you're I doing. And I, I have just a little bit more in this light color. I'm gonna to switch to a dark warp in a minute. I weft in a minute, which will probably go better. It'll show up better. And you're using an end feed shuttle, is that right? I am using an end feed shuttle. Um, I like it. This is a newer, smaller one I just got, which is very nice. And could you talk about the difference between an end feed and a standard boat shuttle? Excuse me? Could you talk about the difference between an end feed and a standard boat shuttle? Okay, so in an end feed shuttle, you use this kern and the string comes out the end. You know what, let me get this out of the way. It was reflecting light. Okay. Um, in a, a boat shuttle, which I'll use in a minute to fill up the end, to fill up the end of the towel, the, yeah, I'm all thumbs. Okay. Uh, the thread comes out the bottom and it actually requires more hand control. So as I throw this shuttle, my fingers will actually stop this from moving. In the boat shuttle, it actually has its own feed control and I, it just stops, when I get to the end, it stops moving, the thread stops coming off. Um, and I'm gonna change shuttles in a minute. So since these are towels, they're gonna to get hemmed. And so for the very end of each um, towel, I do some rows with just some cotton sewing thread um, so that the hem is less bulky. Except I'm a little tangled here, hang on. So I use something called a floating selvage. It's it's extra thread that kind of hangs up on each side. It makes my edges a little bit more even, which I also like. So now I'm going to use a boat shuttle and it's a little bit pulled out. I just ended off this towel. So now I'm just gonna put some extra strings in between. So I know where one ends and the next one starts. I'm 
And then same thing, I start like on the end, the other one ended, little thread. I've started the next towel. Oh, I've made up a whole new design, huh? Okay, I think we'll keep doing that. Well, I'm not sure what I did. Debbie, could you tell us a little bit about your loom? So I have a, um, this is a four shaft loom. So over here, there's just four different shafts. They can come up two at a time. Actually, this one's set up so only two come up at a time. But every time I step on a pedal underneath here, buried the, uh, there, every time I step on a pedal at the bottom, changes which shafts come up. So currently, because I made a little mistake, although I like it, um, on the first time I hit these two and then the next two, and then I go to the other side back and forth. Um, but the threads, the, the way um, each thread goes through one of these little metal pieces, or these are called heddles, and those are attached to specific levers on the bottom. And that lets, tells which thread should come up so that my shuttle with the weft goes either under or over a specific thread. It's very, it's fairly simple. I don't, the only thing my hands do is move the shuttle and the beater. Some people have looms that have table looms that they actually, instead of their feet, use little levers on the top. Um, Actually, I have a castle on which I can take off, which actually may give better light. Here we go. Okay. So now you can see the top of the loom better and see what goes up and down as I weave. In the background there is a very similar loom, but with eight shafts, so I can do more complicated patterns.
Megan would tell you I've just woven well beyond my sweet spot. Uh, yes, you have. <laughs> I had. Well, I wasn't paying attention. I was a little flustered. Um, but I went in most people, and that's the area where it's easiest to put the shuttle back and forth. But so now I've advanced it. And since I want my towels to all be similar lengths, I measure them as I go along. Um, and I know, and I keep track of the inches. It's interesting to me how different each loom is because on my big Norwood, where, um, where you have advanced the cloth, that would be far too close to the breast beam. I would have to push that up a little bit. Yeah, I could actually even probably go back another half inch if I really wanted to. Wow. I mean, to get as much length as possible. But. Um, okay. I had this horrible streak a few minutes ago, which I had to oil. So Debbie, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the actual project? What fiber? Um, how did you plan it? What's the warp structure or the weave structure? Yep. So this is um, this is all cotton. Um, the white part is actually eight two cotton, and the maroon stripes are a little bit thicker. Um, I miscounted some when I did the measured my warp, which were the long threads. So I had to change my pattern a little or my design, but I started with, I started with an idea about how, which threads I wanted to do. And these are M's, M's and W's. And then I um, had to adapt it 
um, just because I didn't want as many red stripes as they, dark stripes as they had. Um, and then I hadn't, when I decided to make the, the whites thicker, I hadn't had enough thread. So anyway, then I decided what size towels I wanted to make, figured out how many threads per inch I need, um, measured the warp, threaded it through each of the heddles on the shafts to make the design. Um, and then figure it out for each towel, I have to weave about 20 inches. Um, I think that this is about 12 and a half inches in the shed. I mean, in the read, read. which is, decides how wide this little slotted thing and, um, or the slotted bar. And uh, then I just started going, doing what I was gonna do. Uh, and I'm just sort of weaving back and forth in a zigzag. Um, on the first towel that I was doing, I was doing sort of what was the equivalent of a V from each side. I would go on the treadles, the foot pedals, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I would start on the other side and do the same thing back and forth. And it makes a totally different pattern. Um, but that's how that works. We have a question from a viewer, which is how does the shuttle get uh, loaded with yarn? And could you maybe talk a little bit about how that's different for a pern versus a bobbin? Yes. So the pern, um, a near empty pern looks like this. And the, when the yarn comes off, it comes off the end. I wind them on the same kind of bobbin winder, but on the pern, you sort of start here and then kind of fill gradually going all the way towards the end. When you wind a bobbin, which has two ends and comes out of the, uh, the boat shuttle, um, most people will start make it a little full in the middle and then kind of work their way back and forth. Uh, but it's the same device, it just turns it on. It's just a matter of how it comes off in the end. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Where was I? So the loom has a break that has to be released to advance the fabric forward. And then it has a crank that then lets me make the warp come to just the tension I want it to be at. We have another viewer question. This okay. question is from Roy and he asked, 
does using an NP shuttle take a lot of getting used to compared to a boat shuttle if you've used that previously? No, I've uh, probably used an NP. No, I immediately adapted using an NP shuttle after trying one. And it's really good for cottons. It's um, actually it's good for all fibers that I think don't have a lot of stretch to them. So I've never used it with wool, but um, cotton, uh, tensile, bamboo. Uh, it seems to work really well, but it was very easy to adapt to. And that is actually the style of shuttle that industrial looms use, right? It is, um, yes. And they, uh, actually I have one. They're also, the industrial looms, shuttles are much more, are, um, they're heavier. But they do do it, they use an end feed system. Oh, here, comes out the side here. Um, but to, just a whole similar thing. And it just, it tensions, the thread becomes tensioned by, uh, let me see if I could get that to light up. I don't think the light's good. There's a whole series of coils here. Although actually, hang on. Yeah, so there's a whole series of coils here that the thread comes through. And uh, this is not wound on a pern. I don't, um, it's just kind of coiled and put in there and then it comes out. And it uh, also has a much sturdier end than mine. It has these metal points. Do you know about the kiss of death in the mills? No. So uh, back when TB was rampant in this country, um, the uh, weavers, when they uh, would load the new yarn into the shuttle, would actually use suction. They would put their mouths on that and kind of pull the yarn out uh, with their breath. And that, that was a, a way of transmitting TB from weaver to weaver, unfortunately. So uh, the uh, public health authorities called that the kiss of death. Don't do that. No. Wow. So the, <laughs> my end feed shuttle has a very nice groove on the top, so I can just fit the thread through it. Um, but you're right, in this one, there is not such a delivery system. You have to, um, I'm not sure how they do it. This came to me like this, but it goes through this series of, of little coils. And I can see where that may be what they do, or they have like now a little hook that goes into it and pulls it through. I would bet you it's something like that in some way, shape or form. Let's push up from the other side. So I bet you there's like a look, nowadays you use like a little hook because it'll definitely go through and do it. Okay, didn't want TV. Okay, we have a viewer request. Um, can you move your camera over the fell so we can actually see your pattern? Okay. Hang on. Hard when it's a computer. There we go. Can oh, you see it? Nice. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is the mistake pattern I have to tell you. The, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I can't get to the other one where I have it wound. That is the, the mistake pattern because I hit the wrong uh, the wrong treadle button. The one down here is a, uh, I don't know. I don't think I can get that camera onto it. It's a shame I can't get my other one to work. Let's try once more for a moment. Nope, I don't want an emergency call. Nope. Hmm. I need technical assistance here. <laughs> so it's okay. Reason, <laughs> Maybe when you get to the next towel and you switch patterns, um, then you can show yeah, us Yeah, we'll see it. That's true. This is going fairly quickly. Um, um, we did have another question, which is, um, 
it was really about the noise of the loom and it is, it is pretty faint. I'm wondering if you could move the camera closer just for a minute while you're weaving so we could hear kind of the, the crash of the uh, shafts and those metal heddles. Um, and I think actually then, if I, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm actually pretty close. We, okay. uh, I'm moving a foot, but let me see, I can, uh, Better? Yes, I think Zoom has some settings that it actually tries to reduce the noise, which um, doesn't help us for this, but I, I can certainly hear it on that first shot. All right. Yeah. We have another viewer question, which is, can you explain how you are treating the flowing, uh, the floating salvages? Okay, so I, um, when I, uh, let me see, I'm going this way. So my, the, the floating salvages have a twist to them. And so like all, all the, all, all threads have a twist to them. And so one of the things I learned is that I have to, when I use the floating salvage, I have to follow that twist, otherwise they break. So I know that my thread is twisting this way, clockwise. And so I, on one throw, go over the thread, just keeping that pattern. And then on the next throw, I go under it. And I do the same thing each. So under the throw, when I go right to left, I'm under. And when I go left to right, I go over. And that um, maintains the twist of it, um, but it also stops. It, this means that the end thread is caught with every throw. Um, something about my pattern I didn't talk about, it's what's considered a twill. So instead of always going, alternating every other thread, I may skip over two or three, and then the next row it's a different two or three that I go over under. So if the, that would sometimes leave a long, space on the edge where I'm not going around the end thread. And it makes the, uh, the edges are not as nice. So using the uh, floating shuttle, I think makes the ends nicer. But that was harder to get used to than using an end feed shuttle. All right, I made a mistake here, but these are guest towels for my house. So they're going to have some variety. That is uh, where all my mistake towels end up as well. So the nice ones go to the sale and the mistakes stay in my house. Right. If these were a gift, I would take out the few rows, but I kind of like it. I have another row that's a little bit off back there. Good. Back three seconds. Always become the weavers. So actually that brings up a really good point, which is let's say it wasn't a full shot that was a mistake, but you um, just skipped a couple of threads and you find that out when you're done. Um, what do you do in that case? So either before I, so everything after I've woven, it gets washed. Before I watch it, wash it, I put a very bright light on it and I look at every, um, I look at every bit and I can show you, um, so this is something I previously wove that I'm waiting to finish, but it looks very nice on one side. Um, but I know there's mistakes in it. And so before I finish this towel, I will find the mistakes and I will fix them by hand. Um, kind of just weave through a new thread of the same color um, and cut out the other mistake. And it works, although, boy, maybe I fixed this one already. I don't think so though, because there's a lot of blue threads here. But um, yeah, so I fix the mistakes. It doesn't affect the, oh, here. So there's like a whole row that's, that I don't, uh, there's a whole row where there's these threads which are wrong. 
So I will sit under bright light. I'll take out this thread and I'll, re I'll fix it into so the pattern is correct. Although this is on the wrong side and it really looks okay on the right side, but I still wouldn't feel good leaving it that way. So it's not- <laughs> That is my least favorite part of weaving is fixing the mistakes. Absolutely. I like to try and find them when I'm, as I'm weaving, but it's okay, it works. And, um, you know, if you remember to advance um, past your sweet spot, you're probably gonna have less mistakes because you're less likely to catch a wrong thread unless your mistake is due to um, stepping on the wrong treadle. We have another question from a viewer. Um, what is the purpose of the top of the loom, uh, which you removed earlier? Oh, so that actually is just a tray for me to put things in. It's called a castle. Um, my loom didn't come with it. My husband made it for me, but or you could buy one. But I, it's a tray, so I keep the shuttle I'm not using. I keep my extra turns or bobbins in there. Um, usually my measuring tape is in there. Um, Pencil if it's, I'm taking notes as I weave. It's just a supply part. In my house, uh, the castle usually holds a cat. Yes, and that, I don't have, luckily I don't have a cat to do that, no, <laughs> but yes. But it's a good thing to leave stuff. On my, some looms actually have a tray that sits right here that serves the same purpose. And so you have all your stuff in front of you, um, right by the front beam. So this loom, I didn't tell you before, folds up. Um, I can wheel it out of my house. I can throw it in the back of a car and take it if I want to. Um, it's also if I don't want to, if I'm not working on this loom, I could close it and use my other one, which makes me do more intricate patterns.
we have another viewer question, which is, uh, tell us a little bit more about the loom. What is the brand? What is the width, the weaving width? So this is a shacked baby wolf. Uh, I have, the baby wolf is about a 26 inch weaving width, which is um, determined by the reed. This, the part here that actually is in the beater. Um, it, you can get it with four shafts, you can get it with eight shafts. Um, I like it. Um, it kind of just works height wise, distance wise for me, it works really well. And uh, I've had this loom for, I think since 2005. Um, uh, and so I liked it so much, which is I have the same loom with eight shafts, but it's a shack, um, comes out of Boulder, Colorado. I've actually been there um, to, to their little factory. It's kind of, you get a cute tour if you're in, if you're in Boulder. Uh, there are other, other lots that you can get this as a skinnier loom. You can get it as a much wider loom and, but they all fold up the same way. If I were to lift the front and the back, um, I could completely lift this up and it would end up being about uh, somewhere between 12 and 16 inches wide. I forget how bit wide it gets. I want to um, drill into your comment about uh, you've had the loom since 2005. So are, you know, do looms have an end date? Um, can they live on for a long time? Tell me about the longevity of a loom. Uh, looms can live almost forever. Um, my other loom, I bought, it was a used loom I bought from someone else. It needed a little bit of rehab. I was missing some parts, but um, this loom could last me forever. There's not any reason. I could choose to replace my heddles. My current heddles are metal. I could uh, change them to a product called Tensolve, which is a, 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 a fiber heddle. Um, I did have to oil it this morning, which I had never done before because as I moved the beater, it was making this horrible squeak. Um, there's some other, there on the very bottom, there's some um, uh, fabric, some loops, some cord loops that attach the shafts to the treadles, the pedals. Um, those could wear out and need to be replaced, but with good maintenance, the loom could last forever. At least I hope so. Right, excuse me a moment. I'll in the back of my loom, there's paper that is between the layers of the warp. And I just have to roll it up some. Also, one of my threads is loose, so it's on a weight. And so I just want to un move that down a little also. This is a very technical item I'm using. It's a bag of marbles.
we have another live stream question. So you mentioned changing heddles from metal to Texol. Um, yes. Do weavers have trouble getting the shafts to fall with gravity um, when you make that change? Because there is a weight difference, right? There is, and and I, I can't really answer that question because I don't, I don't, um, I haven't tried it. Um, I kind of, I like the, the tensile is quieter, I'm sure. Uh, I like the metal, but theoretically it shouldn't be a problem. There's also, some looms have what's called a, um, um, well, it's not this loom. My other loom has it. It's a, oh, I forget what it's called, but it helps the, it helps the shafts go back down after you use them. It works out really well if you're doing a very thick cloth um, or you have a lot, um, like if I work double layer um, and I can't think of the name of it for the moment, um, but theoretically they should slide up and down. No, and I don't think the weight should be dependent, but I may be wrong. We have another question um, and I will give some context. So weaving is typically a solitary sport, right? We don't often have live Zoom broadcasts, right? So we're usually doing this off in our own homes, uh, but we do occasionally get together for workshops. Um, and so in that case, uh, we won't be taking nine foot looms like Stephanie's rug loom, right? We're gonna be taking smaller looms. Um, so is this loom good for workshops? Yes, I've taken this, I've taken this loom to quite a few workshops. Like I said, it folds up or pulls up together. Um, it just gets secured closed, slide it in the back of the SUV or a wagon and off we go. Um, like I said, there are smaller ones, but yeah, this is portable. Um, my biggest deterrent to taking a place is it lives on the second floor of my house. But with help, we get it downstairs. That is always my favorite part of the workshop is wrestling my loom down and up, uh, up the stairs right. after, at the end, yes. That's where having good friends or spouses comes in really handy. But yeah. Um, that's one of the things about workshops is then we, it becomes like a social weaving occasion uh, as opposed to just something solitary. We have a couple more live stream questions. Okay. Um, so one, one is from Linda and Linda says she knows nothing about weaving. Um, so what happens to all the warp thread after the piece is finished? Can it be reused? So the, there's a name for those threads. They're called thrums. There's, um, they're, uh, depending upon your loom and how frugal you are, miserly you are, um, they can be about a yard long. Um, they happen to be what I use if I'm making a big sheet of towels. It's, I'll use some of those between each towel. Um, they, um, uh, let's see, you could use your, uh, your twister and you can make lovely twisted cords with them. Um, but I pretty much use them between my stuff when I use them. Um, there is a, I think that uh, they're called thrums. I said that before. I think in the most recent hand woven, I think there's a whole thing where it, uh, there's a project using your thrums to make these cut 
things. I haven't read it yet. But it's always handy to have extra thread around the house. <laughs> but or sometimes you can actually leave them on the loom. And uh, if you want to repeat, do the exact same thing with the warp that you had on before. Um, this is stuck on. This is so I finished my project. I cut off my towels. I have these threads, the leftover of the warp coming through. So instead of totally rethreading a new warp, I can actually sit here and have a whole new warp and then tie it onto these and then just wind on again. Um, if you do the same thing over and over, that's kind of a nice thing to do as opposed to sitting there and using um, a threadle hook to rethread each one, a heddle hook to rethread each one every time. But yeah, I got lots of these all over my house. If I. Yes, if you have any yes. for John, uh, contact the weaver. We have plenty. Yes, we do. Um, we have an additional question, which is could you tell us the dimensions of your towels? So these towels, they're going to, when they're done, I think they're going to end up being 18 inches after they're hemmed. And I have a feeling they're going to be about, uh, they'll be about 10 and a half wide. Um, they're starting at 12. They may, once they're on tension, really come out to 10 and three quarters, almost 11 um, when they're not so tight. But yeah, they're just meant to be little, little, towels to dry with for guests. Um, when I make, uh, this is the same technique I would use, I used to make kitchen towels, although they are certainly wider. They start out at about 24 inches. That doesn't sound, that sounds really wide. No, maybe 20, 24 inches, 20, between 20 and 24 inches. And those I weave to about 30 inches or 35 inches long, depending upon how big I want the towel to be. So I just have to change threads here so that I'm I usually try to twist them around one another so they lock in. This actually happens in commercial fabric also. The machine will actually um, sometimes you notice there's like an extra little slub or something and that's generally where it's a new thread has been added. So we have a follow up question, which is, um, so you talked about the leftover bits of the warp, but what about the warp um, that you've woven? Does that actually become part of the piece or does it come out? Um, oh, no, no. We think, go ahead. This is, so this is, this warp is part of the piece. Um, it, I mean, it's the, you have to think of weaving as uh, crossing over one another. Um, and so you need the, the warp strands and the weft strands to keep that together. If you look, um, like think about plaid um, or gingham, where you have uh, two different colors and you see how they cross one another. So remember the threads that go either vertically and the threads that go horizontally. One is the warp and one is the weft.
So after I've advanced, I always want to make sure that the beater has enough room that it's not going to hit my front beam to prevent me from um, bringing the threads in, the weft threads in. We have another question, which is, have you found that some designs look good as a draft, but not so good when finished? So in the actual cloth. So that's hard to tell because when you're weaving, something may look like one thing, but it's not until you wash or somewhat fold the fabric that you really see the pattern come out. I think things on the loom look really different than they do once they're, they're finished. But the other thing is sometimes I'm looking at a draft and I happen to be weaving the wrong, what I'm seeing on, on the front is the wrong side just because of the way the shafts go because you have a right side and a wrong side to fabric. Um, some things will actually look the same on both sides of the fabric, but some things look absolutely different. In fact, when I started weaving the first towel in this set, I did not like the way it looked. I changed what I was doing. Um, I couldn't get a good look at the back, which probably looked like just the way it should. Um, but I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to um, wait and see a whole and do a whole towel and then be very disappointed. And, you know, and that's why weavers are encouraged to sample, weave something, kind of wet it, see how it's going to end up. Not my usual modus operandi. I kind of like that surprise at the end, but a lot of people feel that way. I'm just going to end off this towel and start another one. So perfect use of a thumb. <laughs> we have another viewer question, which is uh, with all the limitations on getting out for in-person instruction these days, can you suggest a video or books, uh, which might be good for a beginner to learn about warping a loom and reading drafts? So when I went to learn to weave, uh, before I uh, went, um, my instructor suggested that I read a book. And so I, this is a book by someone named Debbie Chandler, Learning to Weave. I pretty much read it cover to cover, went for my one day lesson, came home with a smaller loaner loom, used it for a few weeks, um, and then just sort of started doing things on my own. There are 
all sorts of different pattern books and then there's also online access but there are things this is this one is specific it just tells me exactly um gives me ideas of how i thread each shaft so each square goes with a thread and so you just follow the pattern this is the first second third and keep going and then it, it also tells you how to tie up your shaft to the to the treadles and then it tells you which treadle you should be stepping on to get the pattern they show you. And that's sort of how a lot of weavers learn how to, to weave. Um, this is a four shaft book. There's a very specific book for eight shafts and for even more. There's a lot of online online resources that um, that people use to get different patterns and different ideas. But um, there are through the guild, the Hudson Mohawk Weavers Guild, there are a, a bunch of connections to people who will teach weaving but but the, the whole idea of having read the book before i even went for a lesson was great i also <laughs> learned to weave using that book um and i think it's great because she gives a really great foundation and then um basically it's like lessons right if you work your way through the chapters you'll learn how to weave plain weave you'll learn how to weave twill you'll learn how to weave lace um, and it gives you a really great foundation for future learning yeah. Okay, Debbie, we are at 101. Thank you so much for demonstrating today. Um, oh, you're welcome. I to thank everybody who watched today. Um, don't forget to check out the weavers listed online at www.hmwg.org forward slash show. Uh, make sure to enter the door prize drawing. Uh, our next event is a video featuring Ken Harrison of Ruxville Farm. Kim raises her own merino sheep. She says she is a chef and midwife and nurse to these uh, beautiful sheep. Um, she raises them um, um, and breeds for uh, both the fineness of the fiber as well as the color. So these um, sheep have uh, beautifully naturally colored um, wool. And we're going to take you through the process uh, of making a set of mittens starting from a sheep. Um, so we will play this video twice through um, and then we will take a break and be back at two o'clock for the fashion show. Thank you.